So, I um, <clears throat> won't talk so much about inscriptions today. I will talk about this structure and the story behind it. The only common thing between my work in both places is Bangalore, which is really the only thing I focus on. This structure here is something which is, I would say, the holy of holies for a Bangalorean engineer or scientist. And there's a, what you're looking at today is actually a much better place than it was, say, a couple of years back. Uh, you could not even walk in here because this was completely overgrown with weeds and trees. And the trees had grown into the structure, it was falling down and all of that. So this has been part, the work is underway, it's been partly secured, restored, conserved by Intact Bangalore, funded by a Bangalorean who is now living in Seattle. The lady who is uh, very passionate about Bangalore history and you know, essentially history is funding the restoration of this work. The work itself is being executed by Intact Bangalore. So the reason I'm saying this is the Holy of Holies is because this is a mark left by a project called the Great Trigonometrical Survey of India. Uh, she mentioned it and it looks like I think more, no, at least not more than two or three people here know anything about GTS itself. You aware of anything about GTS? Any, no? That's very good. Um, so essentially it was a project in layman terms, it's probably one, it's pro, it's one of those scientific projects in the world um, which ran for 130 years and probably is the largest and one of mankind's greatest projects. For example, a few years back, there was this lot of you know, excitement about mission to Pluto or the mission to Mars that people are talking about now or outer space travel by ordinary people now, not astronauts, or the co-vaccine or the COVID vaccine, or um, the Human Genome Project, which is developing a complete um, you know, map of the human gene, or you know all of these kind of projects that are underway today in the world, in the science world. This one is figures in that league. But it's not taught generally like that uh, by uh, people. They think of it as an exercise to develop the map of India or the Indian region, not really India, the Indian subcontinent. Okay. This exercise started in the year 1800 and lasted for about 125, 30, 130 years by that name. The same project continues to this day even now, but it's not called by that name. Officially, they called it off at, you know, in 1930 or sometime like that. So it's a project which ran 130 years and that helped develop inch perfect maps of the Indian subcontinent. When you think about inch perfect maps, think about it this way. If this, between this stone wall and that stone wall, what do you think is this, is the distance? If we were to give you a tape and say, look, measure this. Even then you would all come out with different numbers. This is how tight you hold it, where do you hold it, how do you hold it, it all matter. So someone would say 50 feet, 50 feet, 4 inches. Someone would say 50 feet, 4 inches, 4, no, and, four and a half inches. So it would go on like this. So when I say an inch perfect map of India, and we have this problem with something as close as this. It's, it's, it's something you can you know, see and it's probably a few steps if you walk down. Imagine a map which is inch perfect, which is this small, just an inch, for the entire subcontinent. What does that mean? Is anyone here from Madras, Chennai? What's the distance between Bangalore and Madras? 316. From where to where is that? From, so from airport to airport. Okay. Now they measured the same distance from a place here near Makri Circle to St. Thomas Mount. They measured it to an accuracy of less than half an inch from what we know it to be today. So a point here, let's just imagine this point and say St. Thomas Mount. If you know Madras, St. Thomas Mount is on the what side? Now the southern side. The point there, they were accurate to a half an inch. 
and it, they're accurate on half an inch by today's measurements when we have, uh, I don't know, dozens of satellites up in the sky who help us tell exactly where we are today. Even those satellites would struggle because they would, today the uh, ones that you use on the phone, at best will give you to 3 meter accuracies, which is 12 feet. With 24 or uh, whatever the number of satellites up there, we still can't get that close today. I mean, most of, I mean, the other guys can, general, general people, citizens can't. They developed this map when we didn't have satellites, we didn't have phones, we didn't have laser, we didn't have any of those things. They just have used techniques, simple mathematical techniques to do that. And they did it not between Bangalore and Madras, they, they did it from Kanyakumari right up to the northernmost uh, tips of the country. They went up to Tibet as well and they measured the height, they calculated the height of Everest. The Everest was conquered almost a hundred years after. But they calculated the height of Everest to be something which is less than 20 feet different from what it is today, what we know it to be today. Yeah. So if you are a scientist, if you are an engineer or if you, anyone who cares about being accurate and precise, this structure is the most holiest one for you because this played a significant part in that. Okay. And in a human perspective, the project that ran for 130 years took more lives. This is during the British colonial times, right? Took more lives than all the lives that the you know, Britain fought, wars that Britain fought in that period. So a lot of wars, you know, they were conquering all over the, you know, they were moving around all over the world. So from 1800 on to say 1930, all the battles that the British were engaged in, they lost fewer people in that than in this project. And they lost more land in this project than in those battles. It's funny, isn't it? How did they lose land? Yeah. So the first one happened. How, how did they lose lives? Why did they lose lives? Right. So the project actually team was about 500 to 800 people. So there were elephants. There were horses, there were bullocks, there were cooks, there were coolies, there were all kinds of people. The team numbered about 800 people at when it was the largest uh, thing. Could have been 100 to 800 people at varying times. They covered every inch of the country on foot. So they, were, they, died, they died because of disease. They died because of physical you know, wear and tear. They had to go through rivers, they had to go through forests, they had to go through hills, they had to go through every single thing. So the average life of a sur surveyor, a British surveyor, was I think uh, at least four or five people here wouldn't be you know, alive if we were a part of that team now. It was about 50. So I'm the only one above 50 here. <laughs> okay. So oh, there were more, the average life of a British surveyor was 50. They would not live beyond that because of the rigor of this job. They lost more land because if you never measure the land, you never know how much it is exactly. So when you know when you say how big is this area, you would have said half acre, 20 acres, 50 acres, 1000 acres, so many acres. But when you measure it, you figure it's much lesser. So just by measurement, they realized they owned lesser land than you know they claimed they thought it was there, was over there. So this is a statement made by the Queen. So she said this uh, great technological survey project has cost me more land than all the wars that you know my people have fought in. <laughs> but it's not losing the land to someone else. They just lost, lost. it in their the, she, she, she's, never, she's not anymore the owner of so much land. It's, it's no more there. <laughs> okay. So that's the uh, project. And what's the big deal about he, this story and Bangalore? This project started here, in Bangalore. So it, uh, the British, at one point, before 1799, owned uh, Madras Presidency, the, the uh, eastern coast of India and they owned the western coast as well, Mangalore, Kerala and down. But sitting in the middle was Tipu Sultan. So they couldn't, they could not own land coast to coast. They, they were not uh, ruling coast to coast. They were, ru they were ruling everywhere except in the middle. So in 1799, Tipu was defeated and killed. Right? So when he was killed there, there's this man called Major Lambton, 
was a part of that, uh, you know, the British uh, force, forces fighting with him. So, the, the reason the British would indulge in this surveying exercise is, if they ever, when they come to a new place, they need to understand the, you know, the terrain. The lay of the land is basic to their moving around and capturing territory. Tipu Sultan was a master at this. So, so even before this defeat, wherever they, wherever the British uh, conquered the land, they would send out teams, survey survey teams, to essentially go out and find to develop maps of the place. What they called as different kinds of maps, route maps for the soldiers to walk on, you know, to follow. Then um, you know a survey of the land itself, what tree, what minerals, what's growing there. More importantly for them, when they conquer a land, they get money out from taxes. Revenue is to taxes. So for that, they need to know exactly how much land they own and how much tax is supposed to be gathered from this place there. So understanding the details of the land is primary and that's what these surveys do. So this guy Lambton was not really a soldier. He was actually a civil, uh, he was a surveyor. His job was essentially, you know, he, he was first sent to the US in the Americas at that time when they were going there. And when the British, uh, say, killed those Indians there or conquered the land from the Indians, what they were doing was a little different from India. They were shipping out people from Europe, from England into US and allocating them lands. And what he does is, he's also a inter very interested guy in eclipses and all that. So he turns his eclipse, you know, telescope in towards a solar eclipse, but he forgets to put on that black filter, so he burns his eye. Okay. So when he burns, when he loses his eye, so when he loses his eye, he is no more valuable as an active soldier. So in the British times and even now, they all do double duty. So he may have been a surveyor, but if need in, in times of, you know, if there is a fighting requirement, they would also turn into soldiers who fight. So this guy is no more useful as a soldier and he is uh, sent over, he is kind of relegated to a non-combat uh, related uh, job. He enjoys life there. And, and after a while, just like you know, in any government does, they realize that they have a large non-combat uh, group that they are supporting, they are feeding. And uh, you know, the queen or whoever it is decides, look, we have a, a lot of dead weight here. Either these guys get into regular soldier roles or they quit and go away. And they are given a choice to come to India and uh, work as soldiers here. So, this guy, it's a very cushy job. He earns a lot of money and realizes India is a good place to earn more money. He comes to India here and then he is attached to the Wellesley crowd here. Ends up fighting Tipu. He was on that campaign. He was, in fact, uh, there's a bad barracks here after BRV on your left side. I think they've now pulled down that. You can't see it. You could see a lot of tiled uh, old um, colonial structures there. That's called bad barracks. Okay. So, what happens during that attack is uh, they are headed into Sirangpatna, which is supposed to be south. So the column is headed in direction, which is supposed to be south in the night. And then they discover, uh, this guy is a surveyor, he has some idea of, uh, you know, the uh, stars as well, right? He figures out they are not headed south, they are headed north. The direction they are not, the opposite of which they are supposed to go. Sends word to his um, commanding officer, who is the same guy, you know, Baird, Colonel Baird, that look, you guys are going in the wrong direction. We ought to be going in the opposite direction. So the um, those the other guys are not as knowledgeable as him. They don't believe the Colonel Baird does not believe that story. There's some weirdo down below saying, you know, I'm going in the opposite direction. I know all this stuff and all that. And after a while, he gets a doubt, and then asks someone to take out a compass, strike a match, and check if the direction is right or wrong, and discovers that they are really headed in the opposite direction of which they're supposed to go. And then they go back and then Tipu is captured and killed and all that. This guy then makes a name, comes, he gets to be known as someone who is a wise man. And then when they kill uh, Tipu, he, they all come back here and settle down in uh, MEG center at Alsur. So that place is called Dodda Gunta. Okay, the traditional name for that is Dodda Gunta. So the British also call it Dodda Gunta at that time. And from here, sitting here he makes, a, because he's got that reputation now as a math genius and all of that, right? So he makes a proposal to Wellesley, who is in uh, you know, the head of uh, the Madras, uh, whatever, that look, 
I can help you develop an inch perfect map of southern India, coast to coast map. Now that we own the land, we let's go get to you know figure out everything possible here. And uh, that proposal is approved, is funded. But actually, this guy is playing a game there. He is not interested so much in developing maps of the country. At that time, the scientific exercise, everyone is kind of, you know, there's a race going on between Britain, Britain, France, Germany and all these countries about determining the shape of the earth and the circumference of the earth. Okay, Everybody knew it was a globe. They didn't know how it was. So today we know it's flattened the poles and, you know, bulging at the equator and all that. They did not know that then. So the hot you know, topic between scientists that time was, who is going to figure that out first precisely? And this mapping exercise is actually going to help do that um, in a way. So I won't get into the details, but if they could develop a map of India, they could develop, uh, they could figure out the shape of the earth. A similar project was underway in South America. The Germans were doing it there because the Germans went there. A similar project was underway in uh, Africa because the French guy, French had landed up there. A similar project was underway in Australia, just then, you know, they were just getting in there, a little later than that. So all the top scientists of uh, the world at that time were trying to work, figure out what is the shape of the earth. For that, they needed to measure the lay of the land for a broad area, hundreds of kilometers. And that was that was a perfect place for, you know, was here. South America is all jungle, so Africa is also much the same. So they don't get a thousand kilometer, two thousand kilometer neat stretch where they can develop a map and figure out what's the curvature of the earth and all, but they could do it here. So this guy is smart enough, he wants to accomplish that, but he covers it up as saying a map of the you know, area and gets it funded. So he's sitting at Dodgunta and then he starts measuring here in Bangalore, in, in Alsur. So he's sitting in Alsur and he starts his activity here. So he figures out that you know what equipment he needs is not good enough. It can it should, it can only come from England. So he orders for it, but he found, finds that there's good enough equipment sitting in the country in Calcutta. Gets it over here and starts his exercise of measurement here. So, so the first uh, measure he does is between Lingarajpuram and Agara. Yeah, Agara Lake. Yeah. So. Um, there's a firing range there, if you know, uh, it's, it's Iglur firing range, right? So between Iglur and Lingrajpuram, which is not too far from here, he measures the distance physically using chains. Chain. Yeah. A chain is, uh, you can see some, you, know, you, don't see, you don't see it these days, it's just a link. It's a uh, steel iron link with a hook on either side. So you attach, you know, this hook, the, each latches onto the other and, you know, it runs quite some distance. So, you know, imagine a... Imagine a, a link like this, this is there, so it's hooked to this, you fold one over the other and then you just hold it like a bundle. 50 links and 100 feet long. So you hold one end, let's say she goes to the other end and pulls it taut, that's 100 feet. But they're measuring not just like what we are talking here, they want to measure something which is Madras to Mangalore down to Kanikumar. Right? And this guy is a perfectionist. So what he does is this 100 foot layer chain stretches it taut over pulleys, supports, puts some dead weights on either end, puts it on pedestals, okay, pulls it down, puts a shamyana on top, because the length of the chain varies with temperature. And yeah, this is India, right? So it can go from 20 to 35 degrees in no time. So instead of measuring 100 feet, you could be measuring 99.98 inches or 100.1.0 something inches. Pulls it, puts the, uh, the weights on the either end because you need it to be perfectly horizontal, right? Otherwise, if it is sagging at the middle, then obviously it's not you know, going to measure it accurately. So you drop a plumb line, hit it on the earth, and that's your point. Do the same at the other end, and that's your point, right? But what you do is, <clears throat> you mark this. The way I mark it will be different from you, will be different from her, right? So you do multiple uh, this one and take an average of that. Okay. And then again, the readings, the way I would stretch it would be different from the way you would stretch it. The way you do it in the morning would be different from, you do from the evening. So you do it multiple times so that you get the exact point there. 100 feet at a time, 
they go from Lingaraj Puram here to Agara, which is a distance of about 7.5 miles, 8 miles in 57 days. How do they choose the path? They first did a survey of the land, identified a land which was prefer no, flat with no obstructions, either buildings or trees or anything like that. If there were trees, they would cut it down so that they get a clean straight line of sight between the two places. So the straight line, is it? Yeah. And at that end, let's say the, no, you are seeing Agara at that end and let's say you are standing at Lingaraj Puram. They point a flag post like this and they point a flag post here. So the objective is to measure the distance between those two points accurately using this chain. And you use a telescope. So you fix a telescope here. Which, which is aimed straight at the other end and the chain is moved and the, in the, so that the alignment is never missed out. So I mean like let's say you're standing, he's, let's say he's Agara and I'm uh, Lingaraj Puram. So one step would be here, right? So there's a telescope here that's always looking straight. So the chain is stretched taut and the alignment is always ensured between these two places exactly. So it is a straight line they're going to go. So it took them 57 days because you know, they could take at most one or two links, uh, to one or two chain lens measures every day. Uh, and they meticulously documented this in a book. They had to offset a little bit. They cut down the tree or they do some adjustments and they do go, go on like this. It took them 57 days to go from Lingraj Puram to uh, Agara. They measured the distance to be, and this is not exact what I'm reading, it's telling you. 7,583.503 feet. It's a thousandth of a feet. Accuracy is what they were measuring it to be. 0 0.503 feet between these two places. Okay. Now they know one exact point, despite your fear over trigonometry. There's a very simple eight standard trigonometric equation most of us would have studied. We may have forgotten or we may not worry. If you know the two angles of a triangle and a side, you know every other side and every other angle. Am I right? So if there's a triangle with sides A, B, C length and angles let's say X, Y, Z. If you know X, Z and a side A, you got every dimension you can measure everything in the triangle. So the trigonometry part is A by sin A equal to B by sin B equal to C by sin C is the equation. So if you know one angle, and if you know two angles and one side or if you know two sides and one angle or any of those, then you know all the rest of those, right? So you, what they did was they measured from Lingaraj Pura to Agara. There was a clear measure that was one side of a triangle. And at the end points, they go and keep what is called a, it's a telescope, okay? And let's say Lingrajpura is at that point and let's say this building is another point here. So what they can do is they can measure the angle subtended between that line between Agara and Lingrajpura and this place here. So angle between those. So let's say this is Lingrajpura, this is Agara. Okay. And let's say this is this place here. Okay. So they measured this distance physically using that chain. Now this point here. They don't, what they do is they mount a telescope here and they, they have a flag staff or something here, fixed here. They measure the angle between these two. Okay. Just rotate the telescope, they'll get the angle. Right? No? Line of sight. Yeah, line of sight. So, the, so if, when the telescope is pointing here, it's zero degrees. When the telescope is looking here, it, this angle is discovered. So if they go to this point and they do the same and they discover this angle. So they have two angles and a side. Now you can calculate this. You can calculate this. You don't need to measure this. Right? So now they come here. They, they take another point here. Let's say this is Savandurga. They put the telescope here. They measure this angle. And they come here, put the telescope here. They measure this angle. So that's Agara to Savandurga. No more linear measurements, all angular measurements. Only one linear measurement. Only one linear measurement. One linear measurement is still required. Correct. So the first one is the only one they need. That's called the baseline. It's the base of that triangle. So it's all the rest are adjacent triangles. 
all the rest are adjacent triangles, all the rest are just angles. So all they need to do is put the telescope at that point, point it there, measure the angle. So if I go like this, I keep going on like this through the entire country, I got distances from place to place. So this telescope is uh, six and a half foot tall, half a ton in weight. It's got a magnification factor of 66 or something like that. An object at 60 foot will look at, will seem like one foot. An object at 10 kilometers will look to be one kilometer away. An object at 100 kilometers will look like 10 kilometers away. What's an object 100 kilometers away from here that you can measure? If there's a hillock, if there's a hill and there's a hill 100 kilometers away, you can do it. it. Depends on how high the hill is, that's all. Now in Bangalore, in the vicinity of Bangalore, close vicinity of Bangalore, the highest point we have is Savandurga. Yeah. Nandi is also, uh, the Nandi is also, I guess they're all approximately in that same thing. So from Savandurga, you, they could sight Chamundi. Chamundi is 120, 30 kilometers away. But during the night, when they light a bonfire there and they light a bonfire here, they were able to sight it using this telescope. So the triangles that span, one was say this place, the next one is Savandurga. From Savandurga, they were able to measure to site Banergata or the uh, Chandachudeshwara hill in Hosur. Adjacent to that, there's a place called Devarbata there. If you, you may have gone there for birding and stuff like that. Devarbata where? In uh, Tamil Nadu today. Okay. It's in the Tali Road uh, area, if you know the place. Okay. From Savandurga, they were able to site Savana Balgoda and Chamundi. So they got the measurement exact, precise, three third decimal accurate distance between a point in Savandurga and uh, Chamundi and Shravan Balgoda. Because they got it, I could tell this, you can tell the same distance from this building to Chamundi. That's how they got the distance to Madras or to Everest. So this is now called an observatory. So they built these observatories at these points typically spaced out 70 to 100 kilometers away. And they went uh, entire breadth of the country. So you can imagine that would have been tens of thousands of such uh, points. Now the, uh, the why did it start in Bangalore was accidental because Lambton was here and you know, he happened to be the guy. Uh, that was not by design. But the choosing of these points was by design because he, they they said, look, I want to do this measurement between the uh, no, between the two points, call that as baseline, and these are the two good points that are for that. So let's say this line, they measured, they call the baseline, is because the earth is curved and all that, it's good enough for um, a few hundred kilometers. Then after that, the error starts to creep in. And you know, that's not, that whole reference is not as good as it was when they started. So what they do is they re-measure a new baseline at, uh, you know, in some other place. And then they start using that for further uh, triangulation as it's called. All over India, they measured like this, 11 baselines, all over the length and breadth of the country. And the reason they were doing it, uh, they took 130 years also was, in time they found uh, better equipment. So that, that, yeah, that chain thing was replaced by something else. And these telescopes were replaced with more accurate telescopes. The maths behind those calculations had improved. So what they would do was every few decades, they would redo the whole damn thing again. And at that time, they would have a few more baselines, not the old ones. So the initial ones were 10. Then I think if you think about it today, uh, probably there's like 30 or 40 there. So they started the exercise in 1800 here. Uh, Lambton started, the guy's name's written there. It's spelled wrong, but it's Lambton, L-A-M-B-T-O-N. L A M B T O N. Yeah. Okay. So um, he, uh, the equipment he had ordered in 1800, was manufactured in England and shipped to Madras in 1804. So what he did was he shifted his base from Bangalore to Madras. 
use the new equipment and then headed west from Madras to Mangalore via Bangalore. Okay. So officially his project was sanctioned from as a Madras to as a coast to coast excise, as a Madras to Mangalore excise. So the Survey of India and everybody else calls it as a the as having the project started in 1804 in Madras. So the official records, if you see the anniversaries and all of that are celebrated for 1804. And the first start point is supposed to be Madras. But what is the uh, thing is for the four years he went from here to Kolar. And he went to, uh, till uh, Gubi or somewhere. And then he went further down here till Shawan Balgola. So he had covered a significant area here already in the first four years using supposedly the um, inferior equipment. But he had left precise marks everywhere saying this is, you know, this point is this, this point is this and all that. So when he came back from Madras to Mangalore, all he did was just remeasured them. He didn't, he used all those points. He didn't abandon those. So this is why I say it starts in, started in Bangalore. It's, if he had abandoned all the work he had done before, discarded it, then it's fair to say the project started in Madras and went to Mangalore. But the, but the budget that was sanctioned was titled as Madras to Mangalore. So Survey of India today celebrates its uh, centenary, bicentenary, all of that on 2004, 1904 and all of that. Strictly, they should do it in 1900, and the start point should be actually that Lingraj from point. Okay. Is there a marking there? Yeah. So now coming to the um, point. So now, so he went to Madras and then he started to come back from 1804. When they came here in 1807 or something like that, they discovered that that baseline they had measured was now filled over by a lake. What they thought was good, nice level land, like you said was actually there was a massive water body sitting there, Balandur Lake. So what happened, <laughs> what happened was uh, they chose the southern edge of Balandur to pass over that. And uh, it just so happened that there was not so much, no, the water was lesser in that. And it looked like nice clean level land. Lake beds are very nice green, you know, it's like lawns, right? So they went past that and when they came back here, it was in September, 1907 or 1905, sorry, 1805 or something, September. And September is the wettest month of the year in Bangalore. It's not like the north where it rains in June and the monsoon doesn't, it's where you start, no, the rest of the world is still figuring out monsoons and we are drenched wet here. So come September, it'll get worse here in Bangalore. So, so they came in September and they found a massive water body. And then Lambton's uh, story is, Oh, these local fellows, they played mischief, they dug the lake in the time when I had gone because they don't like us to do these measurements. Right. So they had to redo a new baseline. And that new baseline is one between Makri Circle and this place. Okay. Now this structure is not from then though. Uh, a third time around in 1865, 65 years after Lambton, when they got better equipment, the technology had improved and all, they were re-measuring re the baselines as well. So they re-measured this baseline. They took 40 days then from Maikri Circle to here. If you walk now that distance, it will take you about 4 hours, even on the road, not necessarily straight. A distance that you can walk in 4 hours, they took 40 days to measure using those, uh, that Slightly better improved versions of chains, but that's what they were doing. Fixing it, putting a tent over it, having multiple you know, people take readings, note it down in the diary promptly. If it's rain, they stop work. They wait for the weather to clear. And you know, they, they, in, in the meantime, someone's chopping down these trees or you know, the, dismantling the huts and whatever else is on the way. So they take 40 days to do it. And that's, this is the end point of one of those baselines. The other end is at Makri Circle, inside Ramana, Ramana Marshi Park. And this is not measured to, a, to the third decimal, but it's like to the sixth decimal or something. Because say, 65 years, the, everything had improved by then. If you want to understand how accurate that is, we'll go up there. They, they left us uh, something called a mark stone. It's a stone with you know, hairs, crosshair kind of thing marked out there to identify the point. Put your phone on that. 
take the uh, GPS reading of the light long whatever it is of this place, go over to make a circle, there is a similar mark stone there, put your phone there, take the light long readings and the software can calculate and tell you what is the distance based on the light longs. Compare what you get today with the 24 satellites in the sky and what they calculated, what they measured over 40 days, I will be very surprised if you can tell any difference at all. You probably find your, the error is on our side because the satellites, it is on a cloudy day, our satellites are not so good and all of that, signals are not so great and all that. Now, if you are a scientist or an engineer, this is something that you treasure enormously. Um, Bangalore today is considered one of the science and technology capitals of the world. So, it is being a science and technology capital who is defining the future of the world. You guys are defining the future of the world if you think about it. There is not something more valuable to you or to us today than an extraordinary project like this. It ended up defining the shape of the earth. So, the map story was part of it. Lambton figured out the curvature of the land here and thereby the circumference of the earth. So, he went up to Nagpur and found that this curvature of the earth varied. So, he figured out that the earth was flatter at the poles bulging at the equator and gave the numbers for that. So, the, all the theory I gave you was laid out on the earth. Am I right? So, this triangle stuff works on laid out on the earth. It, will, it also works when it is uh, stacked vertically. So, I can do, let us say I, can, I want to find the height of that branch there. I can do the same triangular measurements and then get the height of that, right? Instead of going on the ground, I am going up. Okay. Okay. Got it right. Yeah, yeah, so, how do I know the altitude of this point from uh, sea levels, let us say Madras? What height is this place compared to Madras is while they are while they're traversing horizontally, they are also doing vertical measurements. So, I just laid out only one part of it. They are doing equivalent vertical angle measurements as well. So, instead of doing horizontal you know, on angles on this way, they are doing angles this way. So, the calculations were so difficult, they would measure on the land, let us say for 3 months, leave these points, you know, they build something there and go away. It would take them a year of office work to actually calculate the distances, calculate the latitude, longitudes and all of that. So, the back office work was significant compared to the work on the field. Uh, so, the calculations were so complex and so um, intense, the guys who did these calculations and remember this is the 1800s, okay. the job title was a computer. So, Lambton did from uh, Madras, Mangalore, went down to Kanyakumari, went up to uh, Nagpur. So, he died in Nagpur. Okay. Uh, so, his grave is um, unmarked grave in Na not uh, near, it is a place called Hingangat about 60 kilometers from Nagpur. Uh, it is a beautiful grave, uh, like the typical uh, British uh, cemeteries, Christian cemeteries we see with a beautiful uh, column stone and this and that and all that. Right next to that very nicely they put a GTS mark as a commemorative, as a mark, whatever you want to call it. So, let us go in and see before it gets dark. So, this is the background but the real stuff is this. Yeah. So, what, so, so the first thing that strikes you when you come here is this pit here, right? You would not expect a pit in a room like this. This was not empty hollow like this. So, below that, it is a, below that was a brass plate, okay? On the plate was a cross, uh, mark, cross, no, a crosshair was marked like this. Over that, they built a brick column three feet on top. On top of that was also a stone with similar marks. Is a stone squarish one with a crosshead on top, perfectly in line with that. Because the one on top is exposed, somebody can damage it. Straight above, if you look there on top, and the center you will see a squarish piece of stone, different from all the rest. Yeah? Right in the middle? It's perfectly on top, exactly the shape square one with a with a hole and a crosshair on mark. We'll go up there and we'll see that. Yeah. So the original point reference that I used is there now. This one has been dislodged by apparently by NAL scientists in the 80s. Hmm? So what they would do is um, so the door, if you see here, 
that telescope which is actually called a theodolite light would, have, would be put on this column here and it's also sheltered right so the door is so wide because if you look straight down here you would see an equal and similar thing in Mekri circle at the Ramana Vishimar path this would be broken open for astronomical for you see, for you can measure latitude through the terrestrial measurements for longitude you need astronomical measurements sighting of stars and all that so the same equipment that would be seated here would be looking up a star so only during that time when they did it they would open this up rest of the time they would close it up so so, so the brave ones can go up